Johanna Hanna Cohn Arendt, German, a Hannah Arendt Blücher, the 14th of October 1906 to the 4th of December 1975, was a German philosopher and political theorist. Her many books and articles on topics ranging from totalitarianism to epistemology have had a lasting influence on political theory. Arendt is widely considered one of the most important political philosophers of the 20th century. Arendt was born in Hanover, but largely raised in Königsberg in a secular merchant Jewish culture to parents who were politically progressive, being supporters of the Social Democrats. Her father died when she was seven, so she was raised by her mother and grandfather. After completing her secondary education, she studied at the University of Marburg under Martin Heidegger, with whom she had a brief affair, and who had a lasting influence on her thinking. She obtained her doctorate in philosophy in 1929 at the University of Heidelberg with Karl Jaspers. Hannah Arendt married Gunther Stern in 1929, but soon began to encounter increasing antisemitism in 1930s Germany. Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, and while researching anti-Semitic propaganda for the Zionist Federation of Germany in Berlin that year, Arendt was denounced and briefly imprisoned by the Gestapo. On release, she fled Germany, living in Czechoslovakia and Switzerland before settling in Paris. There she worked for Youth Aliyah, assisting young Jews to emigrate to Palestine. Divorcing Stern in 1937, she married Heinrich Blücher in 1940, but when Germany invaded France in 1940 she was detained by the French as an alien, despite having been stripped of her German citizenship in 1937. She escaped and made her way to the United States in 1941 via Portugal. She settled in New York, which remained her principal residence for the rest of her life. She became a writer and editor and worked for the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, becoming an American citizen in 1950. With the appearance of the origins of totalitarianism in 1951, her reputation as a thinker and writer was established and a series of seminal works followed. These included The Human Condition in 1958, and both Eichmann in Jerusalem and On Revolution in 1963. She taught at many American universities, while declining tenure-track appointments. She died suddenly from a heart attack in 1975, at the age of 69, leaving her last work, The Life of the Mind, unfinished. Her works cover a broad range of topics, but she is best known for those dealing with the nature of power and evil, as well as politics, direct democracy, authority, and totalitarianism. In the popular mind she is best remembered for the controversy surrounding the trial of Adolf Eichmann, her attempt to explain how ordinary people become actors in totalitarian systems, which was considered an apologia, and for the phrase, the banality of evil. She is commemorated by institutions and journals devoted to her thinking, the Hannah Arendt Prize for Political Thinking, and on stamps, street names and schools, amongst other things. Early life and education 1906 <laughs> Family of origin Hannah Arendt was born Johanna Cohn Arendt in 1906 into a comfortable educated secular family of German Jews in Linden, Prussia now a part of Hanover, in Wilhelmin, Germany. The family were merchants of Russian extraction from Königsberg, the East Prussian capital. Arendt's grandparents were part of the Reform Jewish community there. Hannah's paternal grandfather, Max Arendt (1843–1913), was a prominent businessman, local politician, one of the leaders of the Königsberg Jewish community, and a member of the Zentralverein Deutscher Staatsbürger Judischen Glaubens (Central Organization for German Citizens of the Jewish Faith). Like other members of the Central Verein, he saw himself primarily as German and disapproved of the activities of Zionists, such as the young Kurt Blumenfeld (1884–1963), who was a frequent visitor to their home and would later become one of Hannah's mentors. Of Max Arendt's children, Paul Arendt (1873–1913) was an engineer, and Henriette Arendt (1874–1922), a policewoman who became a social worker. Hannah was the only child of Paul and Martha, born Cohn Arendt (1874–1948), who were married on April 11, 1902. She was named after her paternal grandmother. The Cohns had originally come to Königsberg from nearby Russian territory now Lithuania in 1852, as refugees from antisemitism there, and made their living as tea importers. J. N. Cohn and Company became the largest business in the city. The Arendts had reached Germany from Russia a century earlier. 
Hannah's extended family contained many more women, who shared the loss of husbands and children. Hannah's parents were better educated and politically more to the left than her grandparents, both being members of the Social Democrats, rather than the German Democratic Party that most of their contemporaries supported. Paul Arendt was educated at the Albertina University of Königsberg. Though he worked as an engineer, he prided himself on his love of classics. He collected a large library, in which Hannah immersed herself. Martha Cohn, a musician, had studied for three years in Paris. In the first four years of their marriage, the Arendts lived in Berlin, where they were supporters of the socialist journal Sozialistische Mannschaft. At the time of Hannah's birth, Paul Arendt was employed by an electrical engineering firm in Linden, and they lived in a frame house on the Market Square Marktplatz. The Arendt family moved back to Königsberg in 1909, because of Paul's deteriorating health. Hannah's father suffered from a prolonged illness with syphilis and had to be institutionalized in 1911. He died on October 30, 1913, when Hannah was seven, leaving her mother to raise her. They lived at Hannah's grandfather's house at Tiergartenstrasse 6, a leafy residential street adjacent to the Königsberg Tiergarten, in the predominantly Jewish neighborhood of Huffen. Although Hannah's parents were non-religious, they were happy to allow Max Arendt to take Hannah to the Reform Synagogue. She also received religious instruction from the rabbi, Hermann Vogelstein, who would come to her school for that purpose. At the time the young Hannah confided that she wished to marry him when she grew up. Her family moved in circles that included many intellectuals and professionals. It was a social circle of high standards and ideals. As she recalled it, my early intellectual formation occurred in an atmosphere where nobody paid much attention to moral questions. We were brought up under the assumption, das moralische Verstehen sich von selb, moral conduct as a matter of course. This time was a particularly favorable period for the Jewish community in Königsberg, an important center of the Haskalah enlightenment. Arendt's family was thoroughly assimilated Germanized, and she later remembered, with us from Germany, the word assimilation received a deep philosophical meaning. You can hardly realize how serious we were about it. Despite these conditions, the Jewish population lacked full citizenship rights, and although antisemitism was not overt, nor was it absent. Arendt came to define her Jewish identity negatively after encountering overt antisemitism as an adult. She came to greatly identify with Rahel Varnhagen (1771–1833), the Prussian socialite who desperately wanted to assimilate into German culture, only to be rejected because she was born Jewish. Arendt later said of Varnhagen that she was my very closest woman friend. Unfortunately, dead a hundred years now, Varnhagen would later become the subject of a biography by Hannah. In the last two years of the First World War, Hannah's mother organized social democratic discussion groups and became a follower of Rosa Luxemburg 1871 as socialist uprisings broke out across Germany. Luxemburg's writings would later influence Hannah's political thinking. In 1920, Martha Cohn married Martin Beerwald (1869–1941), an ironmonger and widower of four years, and they moved to his home, two blocks away, at Busoldstrasse 6, providing Hannah with improved social and financial security. Hannah was 14 at the time and acquired two older stepsisters, Clara (1901–1932) and Eva (1902–1988). Topic: Education. Early education Arendt enrolled in the Sittnitsch School, Königsberg on Bahnstrasse in August 1913, but her studies there were interrupted by the outbreak of World War I, forcing the family to temporarily flee to Berlin on August 23, 1914, in the face of the advancing Russian army. There they stayed with her mother's sister, Margareta I and her three children, while Hannah attended school in Berlin-Charlottenburg. After ten weeks, when Königsberg appeared to be no longer threatened, the Arendts were able to return, where they spent the remaining war years at her grandfather's house. Arendt was precocious, learning ancient Greek as a child, writing poetry in her teenage years, and starting both a philosophy club and Greek Greci at her school. She was fiercely independent in her schooling and a voracious reader, absorbing French and German literature and poetry committing large amounts of poetry to heart and philosophy. By the age of 16, she had read Kierkegaard, Jasper's Psychologie der Weltanschauungen and Kant's critic Der Reinen Vernunft critique of pure reason. 
Kant, whose hometown was also Königsberg, was an important influence on her thinking, and it was Kant who had written about Königsberg that, "...such a town is the right place for gaining knowledge concerning men and the world even without travelling." Arendt attended the Königin Louise Schule for her secondary education, a girls' gymnasium on Landhofmeisterstrasse. Most of her friends, while at school, were gifted children of Jewish professional families, generally older than her and went on to university education. Among them was Ernst Grumach, 1902-1967, who introduced her to his girlfriend, Anne Mendelssohn, who would become a lifelong friend. When Anne moved away, Ernst became Arendt's first romantic relationship. Like Arendt, Anne would go on to become a philosopher, obtaining her doctorate at Hamburg, while Ernst became a philologist. Topic. Higher education Arendt's education at the Louise Schule ended in 1922 when she was expelled at the age of 15 for leading a boycott of a teacher who insulted her. Instead, her mother arranged for her to go to Berlin to be with Social Democrat family friends. In Berlin she lived in a student residence and audited courses of her choosing at the University of Berlin 1922-1923, including classics and Christian theology under Romano Guardini. This enabled her to successfully apply SIT the entrance examination for the University of Marburg, where Ernst Grumach had studied under Martin Heidegger, who had been appointed a professor there in 1922. For the examination, her mother engaged a private tutor, while her aunt Frieda Arendt, a teacher, also helped her, and Frieda's husband Ernst Arendt provided financial assistance for her to attend university. In Berlin, Guardini had introduced her to Kierkegaard, and she resolved to make theology her major field. At Marburg 1924-1926 she studied classical languages, German literature, Protestant theology with Rudolf Bultmann and philosophy with Nikolai Hartmann and Heidegger. The 17-year-old Arendt then began a long and problematic romantic relationship with the 35-year-old Heidegger, who was married with two young sons. Arendt later faced criticism for this because of Heidegger's support for the Nazi party after being elected rector at the University of Freiburg in 1933. Nevertheless, he remained one of the most profound influences on her thinking. The details of the relationship remained a secret until Elizabeth Young Brühl's biography of Arendt appeared in 1982, by which time Arendt and Heidegger had both died, though Heidegger's wife, Elfried Petrie (1893–1992), was still alive. Nevertheless, the affair was not well known until 1995, when Elsbieta Ettinger gained access to the sealed correspondence and published a controversial account that was used by Arendt's detractors to cast doubt on her integrity. That account, which caused a scandal, was subsequently refuted. At Marburg, Arendt lived at Lutherstrasse 4. Among her friends there was Hans Jonas, her only Jewish classmate. Another fellow student of Heidegger's was Jonas's fiend, the Jewish philosopher Gunther Siegmund Stern, son of the noted psychologist Ludwig Wilhelm Stern, who would later become her first husband. Stern had completed his doctoral dissertation with Edmund Husserl at Freiburg University, and was now working on his habilitation thesis with Heidegger, but Arendt, involved with Heidegger, took little notice of him at the time. After a year at Marburg, Arendt spent a semester at Freiburg, attending the lectures of Husserl. In 1926, she moved to the University of Heidelberg, where in 1929, she completed her dissertation under the other leading figure of the then new and revolutionary existence philosophy, Karl Jaspers, 1883-1969, a friend of Heidegger's. Her thesis was entitled Der Liebesbegriff Bei Augustin, Versuch einer Philosophischen Interpretation on the concept of love in the thought of St. Augustine, attempt at a philosophical interpretation." She remained a lifelong friend of Jaspers and his wife, Gertrude Mayer (1879–1974), developing a deep intellectual relationship with him. At Heidelberg, her circle of friends included Hans Jonas, who had also moved from Marburg to study Augustine, working on his Augustin und das Paulinische Freiheitsproblem. Ein philosophischer Betrag zur Genesis der Christlich Abendlandischen Freiheitsseite 1930, and also a group of three young philosophers, Karl Frankenstein, Eric Newman and Erwin Lowenson. Other friends and students of Jaspers were the linguists Benno von Wies and Hugo Friedrich seen with Hannah, here, with whom she attended lectures by Friedrich Gundolf at Jaspers' suggestion and who kindled in her an interest in German Romanticism. She also became reacquainted with Kurt Blumenfeld, at a lecture, who introduced her to Jewish politics. 
At Heidelberg, she lived in the old town Altstadt near the castle, at Schlossberg 16. The house was demolished in the 1960s, but the one remaining wall bears a plaque commemorating her time there see image. On completing her dissertation, Arendt turned to her Habilitationschrift, initially on German Romanticism, and hence an academic teaching career. However 1929 was also the year of the Depression and the end of the Golden Years of the Weimar Republic, which was to become increasingly unstable over its remaining four years. Arendt, as a Jew, had little if any chance of obtaining an academic appointment in Germany. Nevertheless, she completed most of the work before she was forced to leave Germany. Career Germany Berlin-Potsdam In 1929, Arendt met Gunther Stern again, this time in Berlin at a New Year's masked ball, and began a relationship with him. Within a month she had moved in with him in a one-room studio, shared with a dancing school in berlin Hollensee. Then they moved to Merkerstrasse 3, Nawaz, in Potsdam and were married there on September 26. They had much in common and the marriage was welcomed by both sets of parents. In the summer, Hannah Arendt successfully applied to the Notgemeinschaft der Deutschen Wissenschaft for a grant to support her habilitation, which was supported by Heidegger and Jaspers among others, and in the meantime, with Gunther's help was working on revisions to get her dissertation published. <laughs> Wanderjahr After Arendt and Gunther were married, they began two years of what Christian Dries refers to as the Wanderjahr years of wandering. They had the ultimately fruitless aim of having Gunther accepted for an academic appointment. They lived for a while in Druids, a southern neighborhood of Potsdam, before moving to Heidelberg, where they lived with the Jaspers. After Heidelberg, where Gunther completed the first draft of his habilitation thesis, the Stearns then moved to Frankfurt where Gunther hoped to finish it. There, Arendt participated in the university's intellectual life, attending lectures by Karl Mannheim and Paul Tillich, among others. The Stearns collaborated intellectually, writing an article together on Rilke's Duino Elegies and both reviewing Mannheim's Ideologie und Utopie 1929. The latter was Arendt's sole contribution in sociology. In both her treatment of Mannheim and Rilke, Arendt found love to be a transcendent principle. Because there is no true transcendence in this ordered world, one also cannot exceed the world, but only succeed to higher ranks." In Rilke she saw a latter-day secular Augustine, describing the elegies as the letzten literarischen form religiosen documentes ultimate form of religious document. Later, she would discover the limitations of transcendent love in explaining the historical events that pushed her into political action. Another theme from Rilke that she would develop was the despair of not being heard. Reflecting on Rilke's opening lines, which she placed as an epigram at the beginning of their essay, Wer, wenn ich schrie, hort mich den aus der Engelorningen? Who, if I cried out, would hear me among the angels' hierarchies? Arendt and Stern begin by stating, the paradoxical, ambiguous, and desperate situation from which standpoint the Duino elegies may alone be understood has two characteristics, the absence of an echo and the knowledge of futility. The conscious renunciation of the demand to be heard, the despair at not being able to be heard, and finally the need to speak even without an answer these are the real reasons for the darkness, asperity, and tension of the style in which poetry indicates its own possibilities and its will to form. Arendt also published an article on Augustine 354 in the Frankfurter Zeitung to mark the 1500th anniversary of his death. She saw this article as forming a bridge between her treatment of Augustine in her dissertation and her subsequent work on Romanticism. When it became evident Stern would not succeed in obtaining an appointment, the Stearns returned to Berlin in 1931. Return to Berlin 1931 In Berlin, where the couple initially lived in the predominantly Jewish area of Bayerisches Viertel Bavarian Quarter or Jewish Switzerland, in Schoenberg, Stern obtained a position as a staff writer for the cultural supplement of the Berliner Borsen Courier, edited by Herbert Eichering, with the help of Bertolt Brecht. There he started writing using the nom de plume of Gunther Anders, i.e. 
Gunther Other. Arendt assisted Gunther with his work, but the shadow of Heidegger hung over their relationship. While Gunther was working on his habilitation schrift, Arendt had abandoned the original subject of German Romanticism for her thesis in 1930, and turned instead to Rahul Varnhagen and the question of assimilation. Her work on Romanticism had led her to a study of Jewish salons and eventually to those of Varnhagen. Back in Berlin, Arendt found herself becoming more involved in politics and started studying political theory, and reading Marx and Trotsky, while developing contacts at the Deutsche Hochschule für Politik. Despite the political leanings of her mother and husband she never saw herself as a political leftist, justifying her activism as being through her Jewishness. Her increasing interest in Jewish politics and her examination of assimilation in her study of Varnhagen led her to publish her first article on Judaism, Aklaring und Judenfrage, The Enlightenment and the Jewish Question, 1932. Blumenfeld had introduced her to the Jewish Question, which would be his lifelong concern. Meanwhile, her views on German Romanticism were evolving. She wrote a review of Hans Weil's Die Entstehung des Deutschen Bildungsprinzips The Origin of German Educational Principle, 1930, which dealt with the emergence of Bildungslight educational elite in the time of Rahul Varnhagen. At the same time she began to be occupied by Max Weber's description of the status of Jewish people within a state as Paravol, pariah people in his work Schaft und Gesellschaft 1922, while borrowing Bernard Lazare's term paria conscient conscious pariah with which she identified. In both these articles she advanced the views of Johann Herder. Another interest of hers at the time was the status of women, resulting in her 1932 review of Alice Ruhl Gerstel's book Das Frauenproblem in der Gegenwart. Eine psychologische Balance Contemporary Women's Issues, a psychological balance sheet. Although not a supporter of the women's movement, the review was sympathetic. At least in terms of the status of women at that time, she was skeptical of the movement's ability to achieve political change. She was also critical of the movement, because it was a women's movement, rather than contributing with men to a political movement, abstract rather than striving for concrete goals. In this manner she echoed Rosa Luxemburg. Like Luxemburg, she would later criticize Jewish movements for the same reason. Arendt consistently prioritized political over social questions. By 1932, faced with a deteriorating political situation, Arendt was deeply troubled by reports that Heidegger was speaking at National Socialist meetings. She wrote, asking him to deny that he was attracted to National Socialism. Heidegger replied that he did not seek to deny the rumors which were true, and merely assured her that his feelings for her were unchanged. As a Jew in Nazi Germany, Arendt was prevented from making a living and discriminated against and confided to Anne Mendelssohn that emigration was probably inevitable. By 1933, life for the Jewish population in Germany was becoming precarious. Adolf Hitler became Bundeskanzler Chancellor in January, and the Reichstag was burned down Reichstagsbrand the following month. This led to the suspension of civil liberties, with attacks on the left, and, in particular, members of the Kommunistische Partei Deutschlands German Communist Party, KPD. Stern, who had communist associations, fled to Paris, but Arendt stayed on to become an activist. Knowing her time was limited, she used the apartment at Opitzstrasse 6 in Berlin Steglitz that she had occupied with Stern since 1932 as an underground railway way station for fugitives. Her rescue operation there is now recognized with a plaque on the wall see image. Arendt had already positioned herself as a critic of the rising Nazi party in 1932 by publishing Adam Muller Renaissance? A critique of the appropriation of the life of Adam Muller to support right-wing ideology. The beginnings of anti-Jewish laws and boycott came in the spring of 1933. Confronted with systemic antisemitism, Arendt adopted the motive, If one is attacked as a Jew one must defend oneself as a Jew. Not as a German, not as a world citizen, not as an upholder of the rights of man. This was Arendt's introduction of the concept of Jew as pariah that would occupy her for the rest of her life in her Jewish writings. She took a public position by publishing part of her largely completed biography of Rahul Varnhagen as Original Assimilation, Ein Natchwort zu Rahul Varnhagen 100 Todestag. Original Assimilation, an epilogue to the 100th anniversary of Rahul Varnhagen's death. In the Kolnisch Zeitung on March 7, 1933 and a little later also in Judisch Rundschau. 
In the article she argues that the age of assimilation that began with Varnhagen's generation had come to an end with an official state policy of antisemitism. She opened with the declaration, Today in Germany it seems Jewish assimilation must declare its bankruptcy. The general social antisemitism and its official legitimation affects in the first instance assimilated Jews, who can no longer protect themselves through baptism or by emphasizing their differences from Eastern Judaism. As a Jew, Arendt was anxious to inform the world of what was happening to her people in 1930–1933. She surrounded herself with Zionist activists, including Kurt Blumenfeld, Martin Buber and Salman Schocken, and started to research antisemitism. Arendt had access to the Prussian State Library for her work on Varnhagen. Blumenfeld's Zionistische Vereinigung für Deutschland Zionist Federation of Germany persuaded her to use this access to obtain evidence of the extent of antisemitism, for a planned speech to the Zionist Congress in Prague. This research was illegal at the time. Her actions led to her being denounced by a librarian for anti-state propaganda, resulting in the arrest of both Arendt and her mother by the Gestapo. They served eight days in prison but her notebooks were in code and could not be deciphered, and she was released by a young, sympathetic arresting officer to await trial. <inaudible> Exile, France 1933 <inaudible> Paris 1930 On release, realizing the danger she was now in, Arendt and her mother fled Germany following the established escape route over the Erzgebirge Mountains by night into Czechoslovakia and on to Prague and then by train Geneva. In Geneva, she made a conscious decision to commit herself to the Jewish cause. She obtained work with a friend of her mother's at the League of Nations Jewish Agency for Palestine, distributing visas and writing speeches. From Geneva, the Arendts traveled to Paris in the autumn, where she was reunited with Stern, joining a stream of refugees. While Arendt had left Germany without papers, her mother had travel documents and returned to Königsberg and her husband. In Paris, she befriended Stern's cousin, the Marxist literary critic and philosopher Walter Benjamin (1892–1940), and also the Jewish philosopher Raymond Aron (1905–1983). Aron was now an émigré, an exile, stateless, without papers, and had turned her back on the Germany and Germans of the Nazizite. Her legal status was precarious, and she was coping with a foreign language and culture, all of which took its toll on her mentally and physically. In 1934 she started working for the Zionist-funded outreach program Agriculture et Artisanat, giving lectures, and organizing clothing, documents, medications and education for Jewish youth seeking to emigrate to the British Mandate of Palestine, mainly as agricultural workers. Initially she was employed as a secretary, and then office manager. To improve her skills she studied French, Hebrew and Yiddish. In this way she was able to support herself and her husband. When the organization closed in 1935, her work for Blumenfeld and the Zionists in Germany brought her into contact with the wealthy philanthropist Baroness Germaine Alice de Rothschild born Halfen, 1884-1975, wife of Edouard Alphonse James de Rothschild, becoming her assistant. In this position she oversaw the Baroness' contributions to Jewish charities through the Paris Consistoire, although she had little time for the family as a whole. The Rothschilds had headed the Central Consistoire for a century but stood for everything Arendt did not, opposing immigration and any connection with German Jewry. Later in 1935, Arendt joined Youth Aliyah Youth Immigration, an organization similar to Agriculture et Artisanat that was founded in Berlin on the day Hitler seized power. It was affiliated with Hadassah. These organizations saved many from the Holocaust. There she eventually became Secretary General 1935-1939. Her work with Youth Aliyah also involved finding food, clothing, social workers and lawyers, but above all, fundraising. She made her first visit to Palestine in 1935, accompanying one of these groups and meeting with her cousin Ernst Furst there. With the Nazi annexation of Austria and invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1938, Paris was flooded with refugees, and she became the special agent for the rescue of the children from those countries. In 1936, while in Paris, Arendt met the self educated Berlin poet and Marxist philosopher Heinrich Blücher. Blücher had been a Spartacist and then a founding member of the KPD, but had been expelled due to his work in the Versenler conciliator faction. 
Although Arendt had rejoined Stern in 1933, their marriage existed in name only, with them having separated in Berlin. She fulfilled her social obligations and used the name Hannah Stern, but the relationship effectively ended when Stern, perhaps recognizing the danger better than her, emigrated to America with his parents in 1936. In 1937, Arendt was stripped of her German citizenship and she and Stern divorced. She had begun seeing more of Blücher, and eventually they began living together. It was Blücher's long political activism that began to move Arendt's thinking towards political action. In 1938, she completed her biography of Rahul Varnhagen, although this was not published until 1958. In April 1939, following the devastating Kristallnacht pogrom of November 1938, Martha Beerwald realized her daughter would not return and made the decision to leave her husband and join Arendt in Paris. One stepdaughter had died and the other had moved to England. Martin Beerwald would not leave and she no longer had any close ties to Königsberg. Arendt and Blücher married on January 16, 1940, shortly after their respective divorces were finalized. Topic: <inaudible> Internment and Escape, 1940–1941. On May 5, 1940, in anticipation of the Germany invasion of France and the Low Countries that month, the Governor General of Paris issued a proclamation ordering all enemy aliens between 17 and 55 who had come from Germany, predominantly Jews, to report separately for internment. The women were gathered together in the Velodrome de Hiver on May 15, so Hannah Arendt's mother, being over 55, was allowed to stay in Paris. Arendt described the process of making refugees as the new type of human being created by contemporary history, put into concentration camps by their foes and into internment camps by their friends. The men, including Blücher, were sent to Camp Vernet in southern France, close to the Spanish border. Arendt and the other women were sent to Camp Gers, to the west of Gers, a week later. The camp had originally been set up to accommodate refugees from Spain. On June 22, France capitulated and signed the Campaign Armistice, dividing the country. Gers was in the southern Vichy-controlled section. Arendt describes how in the resulting chaos we succeeded in getting hold of liberation papers with which we were able to leave the camp," which she did with about 200 of the 7,000 women held there, about four weeks later. There was no resistance then, but she managed to walk and hitchhike north to Montauban, near Toulouse where she knew she would find help. Montauban had become an unofficial capital for former detainees, and Aaron's friend Lotta Semple Klembert was staying there. Blücher's camp had been evacuated in the wake of the German advance, and he managed to escape from a forced march, making his way to Montauban, where the two of them led a fugitive life. Soon they were joined by Anne Mendelssohn and Arendt's mother. Escape from France was extremely difficult without official papers, their friend Walter Benjamin had taken his own life after being apprehended trying to escape to Spain. One of the best-known illegal routes operated out of Marseille, where Varian Fry, an American journalist, worked to raise funds, forge papers and bribe officials with Hiram Bingham, the American vice consul there. Fry and Bingham secured exit papers and American visas for thousands, and with help from Gunther Stern, Arendt, her husband, and her mother managed to secure the requisite permits to travel by train through Spain to Lisbon, Portugal. There, they eventually secured a passage to New York in April 1941. A few months later, Fry's operations were shut down and the borders sealed. Topic. New York Upon arriving in New York, Arendt became active in the German Jewish community. From 1941 to 1945, she wrote a political column for the New York German-language Jewish newspaper Aufbau, writing on antisemitism, refugees and the need for a Jewish army. She also wrote for other German émigré publications and became an editor at Schocken Books, which later published a number of her works. Beginning in 1944, she was the director of research and executive director for the Commission of European Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, and in that capacity traveled to Europe after the war. In 1948 she became engaged with the campaign of Judah Magnus for a two-state solution in Palestine. Together with her husband, she lived at 370 Riverside Drive in New York and at Kingston, New York, where Blücher taught at nearby Bard College for many years. Post-war 
In the 1950s Arendt wrote some of her most important works, including The Origins of Totalitarianism 1951, The Human Condition 1958, and On Revolution 1963. Arendt began corresponding with the American author Mary McCarthy, six years her junior, in 1950 and they soon became lifelong friends. In 1950, Arendt also became a naturalized citizen of the United States. The same year, she started seeing Martin Heidegger again, and had what the American writer Adam Kirsch called a quasi-romance, lasting for two years, with the man who had previously been her mentor, teacher, and lover. During this time, Arendt defended him against critics who noted his enthusiastic membership in the Nazi party. She portrayed Heidegger as a naive man swept up by forces beyond his control, and pointed out that Heidegger's philosophy had nothing to do with National Socialism. Her work was recognized by many awards, including the Danish Sonning Prize in 1975 for contributions to European civilization. Topic. Teaching Arendt taught at many institutions of higher learning from 1951 onwards, but, preserving her independence, consistently refused tenure-track positions. She served as a visiting scholar at the University of Notre Dame, University of California, Berkeley, Princeton University where she was the first woman to be appointed a full professor in 1959, and Northwestern University. She also taught at the University of Chicago from 1963 to 1967, where she was a member of the Committee on Social Thought, the New School in Manhattan where she taught as a university professor from 1967, Yale University, where she was a fellow, and the Center for Advanced Studies at Wesleyan University 1961-62, 1962-63. She was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1962 and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1964. In 1974, Arendt was instrumental in the creation of Structured Liberal Education (SLE) at Stanford University. She wrote a letter to the president of Stanford to persuade the university to enact Mark Mancall's vision of a residentially based humanities program. At the time of her death, she was university professor of political philosophy at the New School. Topic. Relationships In addition to her affair with Heidegger, and her two marriages, Arendt had a number of close friendships. Since her death, her correspondences with many of them have been published, revealing much information about her thinking. To her friends she was both loyal and generous, dedicating a number of her works to them. Freundschaft friendship she described as being one of Tatagen modi des Lebendigseins, the active modes of being alive, and, to her, friendship was central both to her life and to the concept of politics. Hans Jonas described her as having a genius for friendship, and, in her own words, der Eros der Freundschaft, love of friendship. Her philosophy-based friendships were male and European, while her later American friendships were more diverse, literary, and political. Although she became an American citizen in 1950, her cultural roots remained European, and her language remained her German. Muttersprache. She surrounded herself with German-speaking émigrés, sometimes referred to as the tribe. To her, were cliche mentioned real people were pariahs. Not in the sense of outcasts, but in the sense of outsiders, unassimilated, with the virtue of social nonconformism, the sine qua non of intellectual achievement, a sentiment she shared with Jaspers. Arendt always had a best of Fronden. In her teens she had formed a lifelong relationship with her Jugendfreundin, Anne Mendelssohn Weil. Anchen. On emigrating to America, Hilde Frankel, Paul Tillich's secretary and mistress, filled that role until her death in 1950. After the war, Arendt was able to return to Germany and renew her relationship with Weil, who made several visits to New York, especially after Blücher's death in 1970. Their last meeting was in Tegna, Switzerland in 1975, shortly before Arendt's death. With Frankel's death, Mary McCarthy became Arendt's closest friend and confidant. Topic. Final illness and death While Blücher had survived a cerebral aneurysm in 1961, he remained unwell after 1963, sustaining a series of heart attacks. On October 31, 1970 he died of a massive heart attack. A devastated errant had previously told Mary McCarthy, 
Life without him would be unthinkable. Arendt was also a heavy smoker and was frequently depicted with a cigarette in her hand. She sustained a near fatal heart attack while lecturing in Scotland in May 1974, and although she recovered, she remained in poor health afterwards and continued to smoke. On the evening of December 4, 1975, shortly after her 69th birthday, she had a further heart attack in her apartment while entertaining friends and was pronounced dead at the scene. Her ashes were buried alongside those of Blücher at Bard College, in Annandale on Hudson, New York in May 1976, after Arendt's death the title page of the final part of the life of the mind, judging, was found in her typewriter, which she had just started, consisting of the title and two epigraphs. This has subsequently been reproduced see image. Topic. Work Arendt wrote works on intellectual history as a philosopher, using events and actions to develop insights into contemporary totalitarian movements and the threat to human freedom presented by scientific abstraction and bourgeois morality. Intellectually, she was an independent thinker, a loner not a joiner, separating herself from schools of thought or ideology. In addition to her major texts she published a number of anthologies, including Between Past and Future 1961, Men in Dark Times 1968, and Crises of the Republic 1972. She also contributed to many publications, including the New York Review of Books, Commonwealth, Dissent and The New Yorker. She is perhaps best known for her accounts of Adolf Eichmann and his trial, because of the intense controversy that it generated. She was also a minor poet, but she kept this very private. Topic. Political theory and philosophical system While Arendt never developed a coherent political theory and her writing does not easily lend itself to categorization, the tradition of thought most closely identified with Arendt is that of civic republicanism, from Aristotle to Tocqueville. Her political concept is centered around active citizenship that emphasizes civic engagement and collective deliberation. She believed that no matter how bad, government could never succeed in extinguishing human freedom, despite holding that modern societies frequently retreat from democratic freedom with its inherent disorder for the relative comfort of administrative bureaucracy. Her political legacy is her strong defense of freedom in the face of an increasingly less than free world. She does not adhere to a single systematic philosophy, but rather spans a range of subjects covering totalitarianism, revolution, the nature of freedom and the faculties of thought and judgment, while she is best known for her work on dark times. The nature of totalitarianism and evil, she imbued this with a spark of hope and confidence in the nature of mankind. That even in the darkest of times we have the right to expect some illumination, and that such illumination might well come less from theories and concepts than from the uncertain, flickering, and often weak light that some men and women, in their lives and their works, will kindle under almost all circumstances and shed over the time span that was given to them. Topic. Love and St. Augustine 1929. Arendt's doctoral thesis, Der Liebesbegriff bei Augustin. Ver such einer philosophischen Interpretation, Love and Saint Augustine, was published in 1929 and attracted critical interest. Although an English translation had been prepared by E. B. Ashton in the early 1960s, Arendt did not want it published without revising it and adding new material. Although she prepared several manuscripts, she ultimately abandoned the task and it was not published in English until 1996. In this, she combines approaches of both Heidegger and Jaspers. Arendt's interpretation of love in the work of Augustine deals with three concepts, love as craving or desire amor qua appetitus, love in the relationship between man creatura and creator, creator creatura, and neighborly love dilectio proximi, and is constructed in three sections dealing with each of these. Love as craving anticipates the future, while love for the creator deals with the remembered past. Of the three, Dilectio Proximi or Caritas is perceived as the most fundamental, to which the first two are oriented, which she treats under Vita Socialize social life. The second of the Great Commandments or Golden Rule, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, uniting and transcending the former. Augustine's influence and Jasper's views on his work persisted in Arendt's writings for the rest of her life. Already in this work some of the leitmotifs of her canon were apparent. 
For instance, she introduced the concept of natalitat natality as a key condition of human existence and its role in the development of the individual. She made clear, in her revisions to the English translation, through explicit reference, that it was natality that she was introducing, and would develop further in the human condition 1958. Although she did not specifically use the word natalitat in the original German version, she explained that the construct of natality was implied in her discussion of new beginnings and man's elation to the creator as nova creatura. The centrality of the theme of birth and renewal is apparent in the constant reference to Augustinian thought, and specifically the innovative nature of birth, from this, her first work, to her last, the life of the mind, love is another connecting theme. In addition to the Augustinian loves expostulated in her dissertation, the phrase Amor Mundi love of the world is one often associated with Arendt and both permeates her work and was an absorbing passion from her dissertation to the life of the mind 1978. She took the phrase from Augustine's homily on the first epistle of St. John, If love of the world dwell in us. Amor Mundi was her original title for The Human Condition 1958, the subtitle of Elizabeth Young Brule's biography 1982, the title of a collection of writing on faith in her work and the newsletter of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. The Origins of Totalitarianism 1951. Arendt's first major book, The Origins of Totalitarianism 1951, examined the roots of communism and Nazism. The book is structured as three essays, "...antisemitism", "...imperialism", and "...totalitarianism". In this book, Arendt argues that totalitarianism was a "...novel form of government", that differs essentially from other forms of political oppression known to us such as despotism, tyranny and dictatorship in that it applied terror to subjugate mass populations rather than just political adversaries. The book was opposed by some on the left on the grounds that it presented the two movements as equally tyrannical. She further contends that Jewry was not the operative factor in the Holocaust, but merely a convenient proxy. That totalitarianism in Germany was, in the end, about terror and consistency, not eradicating Jews only. A second, enlarged edition was published in 1958, and contained two additional chapters, replacing her original, concluding remarks. Chapter 13 was titled, Ideology and Terror, a Novel Form of Government, which she had published separately in 1963. Chapter 14 dealt with the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, entitled, Epilogue, Reflections on the Hungarian Revolution. Subsequent editions omitted this chapter, which was published separately in English. Totalitarian Imperialism, Reflections on the Hungarian Revolution, and German Die Ungarische Revolution und der Totalitär Imperialismus in 1958. Topic: <laughs> Rahul Varnhagen, The Life of a Jewess, 1957. Arendt's habilitation shrift on Rahul Varnhagen was completed while she was living in exile in Paris in 1938, but due to the deteriorating political situation was not published till 1957, when she was living in the United States, since she had not managed to escape with a copy of the manuscript, but relied on a copy she had given to Gershom Sholem. Ostensibly a biography of this 19th-century Jewish socialite, it formed an important step in her analysis of Jewish history and the subjects of assimilation and emancipation, and introduced her treatment of the Jewish diaspora as either pariah or parvenu. In addition it represents an early version of her concept of history. She dedicated the book to Anne Mendelssohn, who had first drawn her attention to Varnhagen's writing. Arendt's relation to Varnhagen permeates her subsequent work. Her examination of Varnhagen's life is set against the background of the catastrophic destruction of German Jewish culture and its demonstrations of the illusion of any true German Jewish symbiosis and the threatened existence of her subject. In this sense, the book partially reflects Arendt's own view of herself as a German Jewish woman driven out of her own culture into a stateless existence. In this sense, the work has been referred to as biography as autobiography. Topic. The Human Condition 1958. 
In what is arguably her most influential work, The Human Condition 1958, Arendt differentiates political and social concepts, labor and work, and various forms of actions, she then explores the implications of those distinctions. Her theory of political action, corresponding to the existence of a public realm, is extensively developed in this work. Arendt argues that, while human life always evolves within societies, the social part of human nature, political life, has been intentionally realized in only a few societies as a space for individuals to achieve freedom. Conceptual categories, which attempt to bridge the gap between ontological and sociological structures, are sharply delineated. While Arendt relegates labor and work to the realm of the social, she favors the human condition of action as that which is both existential and aesthetic. Arendt had first introduced the concept of natality in her Love and Saint Augustine, 1929, and in the human condition starts to develop this further. In this, she departs from Heidegger's emphasis on mortality. Arendt's positive message is one of the miracle of beginning. The continual arrival of the new to create action, that is to alter the state of affairs brought about by previous actions. Natality would go on to become a central concept of her political theory, and also what Karen Fry considers its most optimistic one. Topic. Between Past and Future 1961. Between Past and Future is an anthology of six essays written between 1954 and 1961, and later expanded, and deals with a variety of different philosophical subjects. Tradition and the Modern Age. The Concept of History. What is Authority? What is Freedom? The Crisis in Education. And The Crisis in Culture. The essays share the central idea that humans are living between the past and the uncertain future. They must permanently think to exist, and each man is required to learn thinking. For a long time humans have resorted to tradition, but in modern times, this tradition has been abandoned, there is no more respect for tradition and culture. In these essays, Arendt tries to find solutions to help humans think again today. According to her, there is no way to live again with tradition, and modern philosophy has not succeeded in helping humans to live correctly. Topic. On Revolution 1963. Arendt's book On Revolution presents a comparison of two of the main revolutions of the 18th century, the American and French revolutions. She goes against a common impression of both Marxist and leftist views when she argues that France, while well studied and often emulated, was a disaster and that the largely ignored American Revolution was a success. The turning point in the French Revolution occurred when the leaders rejected their goals of freedom in order to focus on compassion for the masses. In the United States, the founders never betray the goal of constitutio libertatis. Arendt believes the revolutionary spirit of those men had been lost, however, and advocates a council system as an appropriate institution to regain that spirit. Topic. Men in Dark Times 1968. The anthology of essays Men in Dark Times presents intellectual biographies of some creative and moral figures of the 20th century, such as Walter Benjamin, Carl Jaspers, Rosa Luxemburg, Hermann Brach, Pope John XXIII, and Isak Dinesen. Topic. Crises of the Republic 1972. Crises of the Republic was the third of Arendt's anthologies, and is the subtitle Lying in Politics, Civil Disobedience, on Violence, Thoughts on Politics and Revolution Indicates, consists of four interconnected essays on contemporary American politics and the crises it faced in the 1960s and 1970s. The first essay, Lying in Politics, looks for an explanation behind the administration's deception regarding the Vietnam War, as revealed in the Pentagon Papers, Civil Disobedience examines the opposition movements, while the final, Thoughts on Politics and Revolution, is a commentary, in the form of an interview on the third essay, On Violence. Topic. On Violence. On Violence. The third of these essays, distinguishes between violence and power. Arendt maintains that, although theorists of both the left and right regard violence as an extreme manifestation of power, the two concepts are, in fact, antithetical. 
Power comes from the collective will and does not need violence to achieve any of its goals, since voluntary compliance takes its place. As governments start losing their legitimacy, violence becomes an artificial means toward the same end and is, therefore, found only in the absence of power. Bureaucracies then become the ideal birthplaces of violence since they are defined as the rule by no one against whom to argue and, therefore, recreate the missing links with the people they rule over. Topic. Posthumous publications Topic. The Life of the Mind 1978. Arendt's last major work, The Life of the Mind remained incomplete at the time of her death. During Arendt's tenure at the New School, in 1974, she presented a graduate-level political philosophy class entitled, Philosophy of the Mind. It was during these class lectures that Arendt crystallized her concepts. The class was based on her working draft of Philosophy of the Mind, which was later edited to Life of the Mind. Arendt's working draft of Philosophy of the Mind was distributed to graduate students at the New School during her visiting professorship in 1974. She conceived of a trilogy based on the mental activities of thinking, willing, and judging. Stemming from her Gifford lectures at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland 1972-1974, her last writing focused on the first two. In a sense, Life of the Mind went beyond her previous work concerning the Vita Octiva. In her discussion of thinking, she focuses mainly on Socrates and his notion of thinking as a solitary dialogue between oneself. This appropriation of Socrates leads her to introduce novel concepts of conscience, an enterprise that gives no positive prescriptions, but instead, tells one what I cannot do if I would remain friends with myself when I re-enter the two in one of thought where I must render an account of my actions to myself, and morality, an entirely negative enterprise concerned with forbidding participation in certain actions for the sake of remaining friends with oneself. She died suddenly five days after completing the second part, with the first page of judging, still in her typewriter. The task then fell to McCarthy to edit the first two parts and provide some indication of the direction of the third. Although Arendt's exact intentions in the third part are unknown, she did leave manuscripts such as Thinking and Moral Considerations and Some Questions on Moral Philosophy and lectures, lectures on Kant's political philosophy concerning her thoughts on the mental faculty of judging. The first two articles were edited and published in an anthology Responsibility and Judgment by Jerome Cohn, one of Arendt's assistants and a director of the Hannah Arendt Center at the New School in New York, in 2003. The last was edited and published by Ronald Beener, professor of political science at the University of Toronto, in 1982. Topic. Collected works After Hannah Arendt's death a number of her essays and notes have continued to be edited and published posthumously by friends and colleagues, including those that give some insight into the unfinished third part of the life of the mind. The Jew is Pariah, Jewish Identity and Politics in the Modern Age 1978, is a collection of 15 essays and letters from the period 1943-1966 on the situation of Jews in modern times, to try and throw some light on her views on the Jewish world, following the backlash to Eichmann, but proved to be equally polarizing. A further collection of her writings on being Jewish was published as The Jewish Writings 2007. Other work includes the collection of 40, largely fugitive, essays, addresses, and reviews entitled Essays in Understanding 1930-1934, Formation, Exile, and Totalitarianism 1994, that presaged her monumental The Origins of Totalitarianism, in particular on the nature of totalitarianism 1953, and the concern with politics in contemporary European philosophical thought 1954. The remaining essays were published as Thinking Without a Bannister, Essays in Understanding, 1953-1975 Her notebooks which form a series of memoirs, were published as Denktijbik in 2002. Correspondence 
Some further insight into her thinking is provided in the continuing posthumous publication of her correspondence with many of the important figures in her life, including Carl Jaspers Mary McCarthy Heinrich Blücher Martin Heidegger Alfred Kazin Walter Benjamin Gershom Scholem and Gunther Stern .Other correspondence that has been published, include those with a number of women friends such as Hild Frankel and Ann Mendelssohn Weil. See relationships. Topic: <laughs> Arendt and the Eichmann trial, 1961 to 1963. On hearing of Adolf Eichmann's capture and plans for his trial, Hannah Arendt contacted the New Yorker and offered to travel to Israel to cover it. The offer was accepted and in her subsequent reporting of the 1961 trial in 1963, which evolved into the book Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil 1963, Arendt was critical of the way the trial was conducted in Israel and coined the phrase, the banality of evil, to describe the phenomenon of Eichmann. She was struck by his very ordinariness and the demeanor he exhibited of a bland bureaucrat, in contrast to the horrific crimes he stood accused of. She examined the question of whether evil is radical or simply a function of thoughtlessness, a tendency of ordinary people to obey orders and conform to mass opinion without a critical evaluation of the consequences of their actions. Arendt's argument was that Eichmann was not a monster, contrasting the immensity of his actions with the very ordinariness of the man himself. Eichmann, she stated, not only called himself a Zionist, having initially opposed the Jewish persecution, but also expected his captors to understand him. She pointed out that his actions were not driven by malice, but rather blind dedication to the regime and his need to belong, to be a joiner. In his own words, I sensed I would have to live a leaderless and difficult individual life, I would receive no directives from anybody, no orders and commands would any longer be issued to me, no pertinent ordinances would be there to consult. In brief, a life never known before lay ahead of me. What Arendt observed, during the trial was a bourgeois sales clerk, who found a meaningful role for himself and a sense of importance in the Nazi movement. She noted that his addiction to clichés and use of bureaucratic morality clouded his ability to question his actions, to think. This led her to set out her most famous, and most debated, dictum, the lesson that this long course in human wickedness had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome, word and thought defying banality of evil. Arendt was also critical of the way that some Jewish leaders associated with the Jewish councils Juden Reit, notably M. C. Rumkowski, acted during the Holocaust, which she described as a moral catastrophe. While her argument was not to allocate blame, rather she mourns what she considered a moral failure of compromising the imperative that it is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. She describes the cooperation of the Jewish leaders in terms of a disintegration of Jewish morality. This role of the Jewish leaders in the destruction of their own people is undoubtedly the darkest chapter in the whole dark story. Widely, misunderstood, this caused an even greater controversy and particularly animosity toward her in the Jewish community and in Israel. No other book on either Eichmann or National Socialism has aroused so much controversy. Arendt was profoundly shocked by the response, writing to Karl Jaspers, People are resorting to any means to destroy my reputation. They have spent weeks trying to find something in my past that they can hang on me." Her critics included the Anti-Defamation League and many other Jewish groups, editors of publications she was a contributor to, faculty at the universities she taught at and friends from all parts of her life. Her friend Gershom Sholem, a major scholar of Jewish mysticism, broke off relations with her. Arendt was criticized by many Jewish public figures, who charged her with coldness and lack of sympathy for the victims of the Holocaust. Because of this lingering criticism neither this book nor any of her other works were translated into Hebrew, until 1999. Arendt responded to the controversies in the book's postscript. The controversy began by calling attention to the conduct of the Jewish people during the years of the final solution, thus following up the question, first raised by the Israeli prosecutor, of whether the Jews could or should have defended themselves. I had dismissed that question as silly and cruel, since it testified to a fatal ignorance of the conditions at the time. It has now been discussed to exhaustion, and the most amazing conclusions have been drawn. The well-known historica sociological construct of ghetto mentality.
has been repeatedly dragged in to explain behavior which was not at all confined to the Jewish people and which therefore cannot be explained by specifically Jewish factors. This was the unexpected conclusion certain reviewers chose to draw from the image of a book, created by certain interest groups, in which I allegedly had claimed that the Jews had murdered themselves. Arendt ended the book by writing, just as you Eichmann supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason, and the only reason, you must hang. Prior to Arendt's depiction of Eichmann, the popular image had been, as the New York Times put it, the most evil monster of humanity. Roger Berkowitz, director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard, states that Arendt neither defended Eichmann, nor denied that his actions were evil and that he was an anti-Semite, nor that he should be executed for his actions. But rather that we should understand that those actions were neither monstrous, nor sadistic. In understanding Eichmann, Arendt argues, we come to understand a greater truth about the nature of evil, that individuals participate in atrocities from an inability to critically examine blind allegiance to ideologies that provide a sense of meaning in a lonely and alienating world. Thus, she concludes, thoughtless zealotry is the face of evil in the modern world. Nor was Arendt alone in raising concerns about the role played by the Juden rate. Rejections of Arendt's characterization of Eichmann and allegations of racism against her have persisted ever since, though much of this is based on information that was not available at the time of the trial. Issues around factual accuracy have been disputed, as well as whether Eichmann was merely dissembling. Irving Howe, one of her critics, described how the Eichmann issue engendered what approached civil war amongst New York intellectuals. Howe rightly surmised that, "...such controversies are never settled. They die down, simmer, and erupt again." Thus the appearance of the 2012 film Hannah Arendt reignited the controversy. Berkowitz states that claiming Arendt exonerated Eichmann as simply a man who followed orders, is a misreading of the book. In fact she argued that Eichmann acted equally out of conviction, and even at times disobeyed orders, such as those of Himmler. Eichmann was, as Berkowitz states, someone convinced that he was sacrificing an easy morality for a higher good." What has emerged following this revisiting of the controversy, is a consensus that whether Arendt was right or wrong about Eichmann, she was correct about the nature of evil, in that events of horror can too easily arise from origins that are mundane. Arendt's depiction of the nature of evil has proved both tenacious and timeless in its relevance. While much has been made of Arendt's treatment of Eichmann, Ada Ushpies, in her 2015 documentary Vita Octiva, the spirit of Hannah Arendt placed it in a much broader context of the use of rationality to explain seemingly irrational historical events. Niemand hat das Recht zu Geherchen In an interview with Joachim Fest in 1964, Arendt was asked about Eichmann's defense that he had made Kant's principle of duty his guiding principle all his life. Arendt replied that that was outrageous and that Eichmann was misusing Kant, by not considering the element of judgment required in assessing one's own actions. Kein Mensch hat das Recht zu Geherchen bei Kant. No man has the right of obedience to Kant, she stated. The reference was to Kant's Die Religion innerhalb der Grenzen der Blohn Vernunft Religion within the Bounds of Bare Reason 1793 in which he states Der Satz Man mu got mehr Geherchen, als den Menschen bedute nur, da, when die letzten etwas gebeten, was in sich bos dem Sittengesetz unmittelbar zu weiter east, ihnen nicht gehercht worden darf und sol the saying, we must hearken to God, rather than to man signifies no more than this, viz., that should any earthly legislation enjoin something immediately contradictory of the moral law, obedience is not to be rendered. Kant clearly defines a higher moral duty than rendering merely unto Caesar. Arendt's reply was subsequently corrupted to read Niemand hat das Recht zu Geherchen no one has the right to obey, which has been widely reproduced, although it does encapsulate an aspect of her moral philosophy. The phrase Niemand hat das Recht zu Geherchen has become one of her iconic images, appearing on the wall of the house in which she was born see commemorations, among other places. A fascist bas relief on the Palazzo degli Uffici Finanziari, 1942, in the Piazza del Tribunal, Balzano, Italy, celebrating Mussolini, read Credere, Obedir, Combatter, Believe, Obey, Combat. 
In 2017 it was altered to read Hannah Arendt's original words on obedience in the three official languages of the region. The phrase has been appearing in other artistic work featuring political messages, such as the 2015 installation by Wilfred Gerstel, which has evoked the concept of resistance to dictatorship, as expressed in her essay, Personal Responsibility Under Dictatorship, 1964. Topic. List of selected publications Topic. Views In 1961, while covering the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, Arendt wrote a letter to Karl Jaspers that Adam Kirsch described as reflecting pure racism towards Sephardic Jews from the Middle East and Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe. She wrote, on top, the judges, the best of German Jewry. Below them, the prosecuting attorneys, Galicians, but still Europeans. Everything is organized by a police force that gives me the creeps, speaks only Hebrew, and looks Arabic. Some downright brutal types among them. They would obey any order. And outside the doors, the Oriental mob, as if one were in Istanbul or some other half-Asiatic country. Although Arendt remained a Zionist both during and after World War II, she made it clear that she favored the creation of a Jewish Arab federated state in Palestine, rather than a purely Jewish state. She believed that this was a way to address Jewish statelessness and to avoid the pitfalls of nationalism. It was not just Arendt's analysis of the Eichmann trial that drew accusations of racism. In her 1958 essay in dissent entitled Reflections on Little Rock she expressed opposition to desegregation following the 1957 Little Rock integration crisis in Arkansas. As she explains in the preface, for a long time the magazine was reluctant to print her contribution, so far did it appear to differ from the publication's liberal values. Eventually it was printed alongside critical responses. Later the New Yorker would express similar hesitancy over the Eichmann papers. So vehement was the response, that Arendt felt obliged to defend herself in a sequel. The debate over this essay has continued since. William Simmons devotes a whole section of his 2011 text on human rights, human rights law and the marginalized other to a critique of Arendt's position and in particular on Little Rock. While a number of critics feel she was fundamentally racist, many of those who have defended Arendt's position have pointed out that her concerns were for the welfare of the children, a position she maintained throughout her life. She felt that the children were being subjected to trauma in order to serve a broader political strategy of forcible integration. While over time Arendt conceded some ground to her critics, namely that she argued as an outsider, she remained committed to her central critique that children should not be thrust into the front lines of geopolitical conflict. Topic. Feminism Embraced by feminists, as a pioneer in a world dominated by men up to her time, she would be very surprised to hear herself described as a feminist, remaining opposed to the social dimensions of women's liberation, urging independence, but always keeping in mind viva la petite difference. On becoming the first woman to be appointed a professor at Princeton, the media were much engaged in this achievement, but she never wanted to be seen as an exception, either as a woman an exception woman, or a Jew, stating emphatically. I am not disturbed at all about being a woman professor, because I am quite used to being a woman." She rather enjoyed what she saw as the privileges of being feminine as opposed to feminist, "...intensely feminine and therefore no feminist," stated Hans Jonas. Arendt considered some professions and positions unsuitable for women, particularly those involving leadership, telling Gunter Gauss, "...it just doesn't look good when a woman gives orders." Despite these views, and having been labeled anti-feminist, much space has been devoted to examining Arendt's place in relation to feminism. In the last years of her life, Virginia Held noted that Arendt's views evolved with the emergence of a new feminism in America in the 1970s to recognize the importance of the women's movement. Topic. Critique of human rights In The Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt devotes a lengthy chapter The Decline of the Nation State and the End of the Rights of Man to a critical analysis of human rights, in what has been described as the most widely read essay on refugees ever published. Arendt is not skeptical of the notion of political rights in general, but instead defends a national or civil conception of rights. 
Human rights, or the rights of man as they were commonly called, are universal, inalienable, and possessed simply by virtue of being human. In contrast, civil rights are possessed by virtue of belonging to a political community, most commonly by being a citizen. Arendt's primary criticism of human rights is that they are ineffectual and illusory because their enforcement is in tension with national sovereignty. She argued that since there is no political authority above that of sovereign nations, state governments have little incentive to respect human rights when such policies conflict with national interests. This can be seen most clearly by examining the treatment of refugees and other stateless people. Since the refugee has no state to secure their civil rights, the only rights they have to fall back on are human rights. In this way Arendt uses the refugee as a test case for examining human rights in isolation from civil rights. Arendt's analysis draws on the refugee upheavals in the first half of the 20th century along with her own experience as a refugee fleeing Nazi Germany. She argued that as state governments began to emphasize national identity as a prerequisite for full legal status, the number of minority resident aliens increased along with the number of stateless persons whom no state was willing to recognize legally. The two potential solutions to the refugee problem, repatriation and naturalization, both proved incapable of solving the crisis. Arendt argued that repatriation failed to solve the refugee crisis because no government was willing to take them in and claim them as their own. When refugees were forcibly deported to neighboring countries, such immigration was deemed illegal by the receiving country, and so failed to change the fundamental status of the migrants as stateless. Attempts at naturalizing and assimilating refugees also had little success. This failure was primarily the result of resistance from both state governments and the majority of citizens, since both tended to see the refugees as undesirables who threatened their national identity. Resistance to naturalization also came from the refugees themselves who resisted assimilation and attempted to maintain their own ethnic and national identities. Arendt contends that neither naturalization nor the tradition of asylum was capable of handling the sheer number of refugees. Instead of accepting some refugees with legal status, the state often responded by denaturalizing minorities who shared national or ethnic ties with stateless refugees. Arendt argues that the consistent mistreatment of refugees, most of whom were placed in internment camps, is evidence against the existence of human rights. If the notion of human rights as universal and inalienable is to be taken seriously, the rights must be realizable given the features of the modern liberal state. She concluded. The rights of man, supposedly inalienable, proved to be unenforceable even in countries whose constitutions were based upon them whenever people appeared who were no longer citizens of any sovereign state. Arendt contends that they are not realizable because they are in tension with at least one feature of the liberal state national sovereignty. One of the primary ways in which a nation exercises sovereignty is through control over national borders. State governments consistently grant their citizens free movement to traverse national borders. In contrast, the movement of refugees is often restricted in the name of national interests. This restriction presents a dilemma for liberalism because liberal theorists typically are committed to both human rights and the existence of sovereign nations. In one of her most quoted passages, she puts forward the concept that human rights are little more than an abstraction. The conception of human rights based upon the assumed existence of a human being as such broke down at the very moment when those who professed to believe in it were for the first time confronted with people who had indeed lost all other qualities and specific relationships, except that they were still human. The world found nothing sacred in the abstract nakedness of being human. In popular culture Several authors have written biographies that focus on the relationship between Hannah Arendt and Martin Heidegger. In 1999, the French feminist philosopher Catherine Clement wrote a novel, Martin and Hannah, speculating on the triangular relationship between Heidegger and the two women in his life, Arendt and Heidegger's wife Elfried Petrie. In addition to the relationships, the novel is a serious exploration of philosophical ideas, that centers on Arendt's last meeting with Heidegger in Freiburg in 1975. The scene is based on Elizabeth Young Brule's description in Hannah Arendt, For Love of the World 1982, but reaches back to their childhoods, and Heidegger's role in encouraging the relationship between the two women. The novel explores Heidegger's embrace of Nazism as a proxy for that of Germany and, as in Arendt's treatment of Eichmann, the difficult relationship between collective guilt and personal responsibility. 
Clement also brings Hannah's other mentor and confidant, Carl Jaspers, into the matrix of relationships. Topic. Hannah Arendt 2012. Arendt's life remains part of current culture and thought. In 2012 the German film, Hannah Arendt, directed by Margareta von Trotta was released. The film, with Barbara Sukawa in the title role, depicted the controversy over Arendt's coverage of the Eichmann trial and subsequent book, in which she was widely misunderstood as defending Eichmann and blaming Jewish leaders for the Holocaust. Topic. Legacy Hannah Arendt is widely considered one of the most influential political philosophers of the 20th century. As a political theorist, moral philosopher and polemicist, she is unmatched in both range and rigor. In 1998 Walter Lacour stated, No 20th century philosopher and political thinker has at the present time as wide an echo. As philosopher, historian, sociologist and also journalist. In popular imagination she is known primarily for the reaction to her work on Adolf Eichmann, and in particular for the one phrase, the banality of evil. Arendt's legacy has been described as a cult, yet she shunned publicity, never expecting, as she explained to Carl Jaspers in 1951, to see herself as a cover girl on the newsstands. In Germany, there are tours available of sites associated with her life. The study of the life and work of Hannah Arendt, and of her political and philosophical theory is described as Arendtian. In her will she established the Hannah Arendt Blücher Literary Trust as the custodian of her writings and photographs. Her personal library was deposited at Bard College at the Stevenson Library in 1976, and includes approximately 4,000 books, ephemera, and pamphlets from Arendt's last apartment as well as her desk in McCarthy House. The college has begun archiving some of the collection digitally, which is available at the Hannah Arendt Collection. Most of her papers were deposited at the Library of Congress and her correspondence with her German friends and mentors, such as Heidegger, Blumenfeld and Jaspers, at the Deutsches Literaturarchiv in Marbach. The Library of Congress listed more than 50 books written about her in 1998, and that number has continued to grow, as have the number of scholarly articles, estimated as 1,000 at that time. Her life and work is recognized by the institutions most closely associated with her teaching, by the creation of Hannah Arendt Centers at both Bard Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities and the New School, both in New York State. In Germany, her contributions to understanding authoritarianism is recognized by the Hannah Arendt Institute für Totalitarismusforschung Hannah Arendt Institute for the Research on Totalitarianism in Dresden. There are Hannah Arendt Associations Hannah Arendt Viren, such as the Hannah Arendt Viren für Politisches Denken in Bremen that awards the annual Hannah Arendt Preis für Politisches Denken Hannah Arendt Prize for Political Thinking established in 1995. In Oldenburg, the Hannah Arendt Center at Karl von Ossietzky University was established in 1999, and holds a large collection of her work Hannah Arendt Archive, and administers the internet portal hannaharendt.net a journal for political thinking as well as a monograph series, the Hannah Arendt Studien. In Italy, the Hannah Arendt Center for Political Studies is situated at the University of Verona for Arendtian Studies. In 2017 a journal, Arendt Studies, was launched to publish articles related to the study of the life, work, and legacy of Hannah Arendt. Many places associated with her, have memorabilia of her on display, such as her student card at the University of Heidelberg see image, 2006, the anniversary of her birth, saw commemorations of her work in conferences and celebrations around the world. In 2015, the filmmaker Ada Ushpies produced a documentary on Hannah Arendt, Vita Octiva, The Spirit of Hannah Arendt. The New York Times designated it a New York Times critic's pick. Of the many photographic portraits of Arendt, that taken in 1944 by Fred Stein see image, whose work she greatly admired, has become iconic, and has been described as better known than the photographer himself, having appeared on a German postage stamp, see image among organizations that have recognized Arendt's contributions to civilization and human rights, is the United Nations Refugee Agency UNHCR. Topic. Contemporary relevance. 
The rise of nativism, such as the election of Donald Trump in America, and concerns regarding an increasing authoritarian style of governance has led to radio broadcasts and writers, including Jeremy Adelman and Zoe Williams, to revisit Arendt's ideas to seek the extent to which they inform our understanding of such movements. At the same time Amazon reported that it had sold out of copies of The Origins of Totalitarianism 1951. In particular Machiko Kakutani has addressed what she refers to as the death of truth. In her book, she argues that the rise of totalitarianism has been founded on the violation of truth. She begins her book with an extensive quote from the origins of totalitarianism. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction i.e., the reality of experience and the distinction between true and false i.e., the standards of thought no longer exist. Kakutani believed that Arendt's words speak not just events of a previous century but apply equally to the contemporary cultural landscape populated with fake news and lies. She also draws on Arendt's essay, Lying in Politics, from crises in the Republic pointing to the lines, The historian knows how vulnerable is the whole texture of facts in which we spend our daily life, it is always in danger of being perforated by single lies or torn to shreds by the organized lying of groups, nations, or classes, or denied and distorted, often carefully covered up by reams of falsehoods or simply allowed to fall into oblivion. Facts need testimony to be remembered and trustworthy witnesses to be established in order to find a secure dwelling place in the domain of human affairs. Arendt drew attention to the critical role that propaganda plays in gaslighting populations, Kakutani observes, citing the passage, In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that, under such conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day, and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism. Instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them, they would protest that they had known all along that the statement was a lie and would admire the leaders for their superior tactical cleverness. But it is also relevant that Aaron took a broader perspective on history than merely totalitarianism in the early 20th century, stating, The deliberate falsehood and the outright lie have been used as legitimate means to achieve political ends since the beginning of recorded history. Contemporary relevance is also reflected in the increasing use of the phrase, attributed to her, No one has the right to obey to reflect that actions result from choices, and hence judgment, and that we cannot disclaim responsibility for that which we have the power to act upon. In addition those centers established to promote Arendtian studies continue to seek solutions to a wide range of contemporary issues in her writing. Arendt's teachings on obedience have also been linked to the controversial psychology experiments by Stanley Milgram, that implied that ordinary people can easily be induced to commit atrocities. Milgram himself drew attention to this in 1974, stating that he was testing the theory that Eichmann like others would merely follow orders, but unlike Milgram she argued that actions involve responsibility. Another Arendtian theme that finds an echo in contemporary society is her observation, inspired by Rilke, of the despair of not being heard, the futility of tragedy that finds no listener that can bring comfort, assurance and intervention. An example of this being gun violence in America and the resulting political inaction. Topic. Commemorations Many of the houses in which Hannah Arendt lived, bear commemorative plaques such as that shown on this page for Heidelberg, and also Marburg and Berlin. In 2017, Babelsberg announced it would erect a plaque on her home there. Her birth town of Linden, Hanover celebrates her name in a variety of ways, including a plaque. The city library has a Hannah Arendt room, exhibiting her personal possessions. Her house bears a plaque, two schools and a road Hannah Arendt Weg near the town hall are named after her, as is the square in front of the state parliament Hannah Arendt Platz. There is a Hannah Arendt Fellowship and a Hannah Arendt Chair at the Helena Lang Schule, while Hanover celebrates Hannah Arendt Days Hannah Arendt Tagen. Her birthplace also has a mural on a wall in the courtyard, bearing the inscription Niemann hat das Recht zu Geherchen No one has the right to obey, a saying often attributed to her as summarizing her verdict on Adolf Eichmann. 
Her contributions to resistance and rescue are commemorated at the Gedenkstadt Deutscher Widerstand German Resistance Memorial Center in Berlin. Hannah Arendt has been honored by the use of her name in many contexts, including the asteroid 100,027 Hannah Arendt, 1990. The Hannah Arendt intercity express train between Karlsruhe and her birthplace, Hanover. Several streets, areas and parks are named after Arendt in Germany and Austria, including Hannah Arendt, Strasse in Berlin Mitte, which runs beside the Holocaust Memorial, Berlin near the Brandenburg Gate shown here, Hannah Arendt, Strasse in Marburg and Hannah Arendt Park Vienna. In France there is a place Hannah Arendt Paris and many streets named Rue Hannah Arendt, including Strasbourg and Tours. In addition to Hanover, a number of schools in Germany have been named after Hannah Arendt, including those at Halleck, Barsinghausen, Langerich, Westphalia, and Berlin. In 1988, Deutsche Post issued a 170 pf stamp, see image, as part of its Frauen der Deutschen Geschichte series, and another was issued in 2006 to celebrate the centennial of her birth, see image. In 2014, Google Doodle celebrated the 108th anniversary of her birth. In 2014, the French philosopher Michel Onfray devoted a series of lectures, broadcast on the national French radio station France Culture, to an analysis of the work of Arendt. In 2017, the former Casa del Fascio in Balzano, adorned with a monumental fascist bas-relief, has been recontextualized with a superimposed encryption quoting Hannah Arendt. Topic. Family tree. Topic. See also Topic. Notes Topic. References Topic. Bibliography Topic. Bibliographic notes Topic. External links <inaudible>